So this is take two of welcome to the 1000 Hours Outside podcast, because uh, I said someone's name wrong. We have uh, Gabby Salazar and Claire Fiesler here today, and I'm so excited because last week they just launched a brand new book uh, called No Boundaries, and the subtitle is 25 Women Explorers and Scientists Share Adventures, Inspiration, and Advice. I love the book. Welcome, Claire and Gabby. Thank you so much for having us on, Jenny. Yeah, yeah. We're so happy, happy to be here. here. Gabby was saying that this is the first uh, podcast about this book that you guys have done together. So I'm like this, and this is the first podcast I've ever done with more than one other person. So it's like, a, this is a party. I think it's it, super fun. It is, you know, uh, Gabby and I have been doing a lot of different interviews for this book. We've been so thrilled by the reception of the book. So many people are interested. I mean, the book is written for, um, yeah, middle schoolers, but so many adults. <laughs> yeah, I really too. like it. I got a whole lot out of it. Um, it's a beautiful book. So, okay, so you, the both of you, Gabby and Claire, are National Geographic Explorers. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. that's what it says in your bio in the back. Um, and you can you can tell us a little bit more about yourself. But man, that caught my attention. How do you how do you become a National Geographic Explorer? Well, we, uh, yeah, we, we both have received grants from the National Geographic Society for projects. So we have applied to them and said, here's an idea, here's an expedition we want to do, and they have provided funding and support. And so that's the way that you become a part of the National Geographic wow. Explorer community. And there's a community of thousands of people. Oh, that's what world. I was going to ask. Are there yeah. lots of National Geographic Explorers? And so, and so um, Gabby, how long have you been a National Geographic Explorer? Well, about about 10 years for me, I think. Although oh, at first I was a young explorer. Now I think I am no longer a young explorer. <laughs> I think you're, you <laughs> look like was, a young explorer. <laughs> I was definitely at first. And, and Claire, you're about the same, right? Yeah, I think it's more than 10 years now. I think I got my first young explorer grant. I was the first class of young explorers, Gabby. Wow, yeah, tell us what yeah. that means. Tell us well, what, there, what there is, that means. There was one young explorer grant that was... Uh, ben, I forget, I'm forgetting his last name. And it was the very first time they gave a grant to someone who was like really young and, and not didn't have as much like a, a big resume, but they thought the idea was good. And then a woman named Rebecca Martin, who was a program officer at National Geographic, who's really become a mentor for me. And I really owe a lot of the, the you know, a, a lot of the success I've had at Geographic to her. She kind of created this program to create more of those kind of grants. Um, of, you know, instead of funding the Bob Ballard, Bob Ballard, you know, discovered the Titanic, you know, like he's also an National Geographic Explorer. Yeah. And then, but then uh, we thought, you know, there's a, there's an opportunity to kind of uh, create like a stepping stone for people to get into the mm. community. And so Gabby and I were part of this kind of like uh, mentoring program where the, the grants we got were, were much smaller, but we, we, it was a great opportunity. And I will say that that program was um, the very first National Geographic program that was 50% women and 50% men. And I okay. think that was really a great thing for us because some of the national, a lot of the National Geographic explorers at that time were predominantly male, predominantly white, you know? And I think that was kind of like an early, my introduction to the National Ge- Geographic Explorer community was like my early, you know, the early thoughts of this book of, okay, how can we di- di- diversify who is an explorer? And the explorer mm-hmm. community is much more diverse now. But like, and how can we diversify the idea of what an explorer is, you know, in like our, in our imagination too. And you sure have done that with this book. It's fantastic. I I like, it's so eclectic, um, you know, in terms of, of the women that you highlighted and where they live and what they're doing. And so I thought that was really neat. Do you remember, I mean, is it something that you remember what your first grant was or, or what was your, you know, the first thing you were going for? Sure. Yeah. I, I, my first grant was uh, to spend time as a photographer documenting conservation efforts around a new highway that was being built in Peru uh, between um, the Andes, the high mountains uh, down to the Amazon rainforest. And so I got to spend almost 10 months down there kind of camping out, hanging out in the rainforest, photographing and trying to understand the impact of the road on people Hmm. and wildlife. Wow. And Claire, do you remember yours, Claire? I do. Yeah. Mine was based in Belize and it was after I finished my master's degree, um, I had an idea to kind of do a second project related to um, a really new innovative conservation 
law that was enacted in Belize. In, enacted in Belize. It was the first law to protect um, kind of like a keystone species, like a, a, a species, hmm. they're called parrotfish. And to protect them, to protect, try to protect the reef. And there's a whole, you know, ecological reason why those parrotfish are, are like, um, are they the arguably, ones that poop sand? Yes. From, yes. It's the one from the, you know, from the BBC. Yeah. Yeah. And, they poop, and they poop a ton of sand. They poop so much sand. The reason why they poop sand is because they have these, like, they're called parrotfish because they look, they have, you know, what to us look like, like these large beaks and they use yeah. those beaks to kind of scrape the corals and they kind of eat the algae that are on top of the corals. But as they're eating the algae, little pieces of the, um, the, the crustose coralline comes out, like the little kind of top of the algae or of the, of the coral. And then they digest it. That is essentially kind of like hard, like a hard rock. Yeah. And they make kind of, their body makes it into a sand like substance. Yeah. And, um, that's why they, they poop sand, which is great because, um, when they eat the algae, they're kind of helping free up space on the coral reef for little yep. baby corals to kind of land and grow, mm-hmm. you know? And so they, they provide, uh, with you know, what's kind of known as like a keystone role in the community. So anyways, yeah. my, my, my grant was trying to understand um, kind of the ecological role of the, of, the, of the conservation measure, like how successful it was. But also I went and interviewed, you know, I spent like two months in Belize interviewing fishermen across the community. <clears throat> and some of these fishing communities, you know, you can only take a boat into them. There's no roads that, that get mm-hmm. there and um interviewing them um about you know you know to what extent they're aware of the conservation measure and uh, to what extent they are abiding by it and trying to understand how successful it is so that other countries in the in the caribbean could also protect parrotfish who play this really yeah i mean you have to protect you have to protect any bird that poops sand i mean i know yeah (laughs) and looks like an amazing parrot I mean, you guys have, what a, what a start, what a, what experiences. I mean, these are phenomenal. Um, And and when you were younger to have these really uh, just immersive, I mean, they're long, really cool experiences. Can we dive a little bit more into about the two of you? So uh, in the back of the book here, Gabby, it says, you're a nature and conservation photographer, a social scientist. Um, you've worked around the globe, um, and you're also a PhD. So, can you tell us just, you know, briefly a little bit more about you? Sure. So, I am currently at oh, University wait. of. Oh yeah, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm currently at University of Florida, and I am studying environmental education and environmental marketing as a PhD student, and. I spent about nine, 10 years before coming back to school, just uh, creating images and kind of trying to tell environmental stories through photography. So I really like, I started photography when I was little, I was maybe 11 years old and it was mostly nature photography. And then as I got older and I saw more environmental issues, I thought, wow, this is a great opportunity to use photography in kind of this like mission driven purpose. And so- Can I interject? Yeah. Gabby- Gabby is a fantastic photographer. When she was like 15 years old, she was winning like global awards and having her oh. images hung in the you know museum. So Gabby, you are Thanks. like a renowned photographer. Wow, it's that, been a fun journey. That's phenomenal. <laughs> I got I I'm excited to go and look at your photography. And I think I misspoke. I said you have your PhD, but you are you're getting your PhD this year. It's on the horizon. I'm you're so it. close. <laughs> uh, congrats in advance you. to you. It's coming this fall, right? Uh, fingers crossed. Abs- that's what we're aiming for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so you're a photographer when you were young and uh, just uh, a world famous one. And this has taken you down uh, quite a path. Oh, it's been a great journey. And, you know, community has been a big part of that for me. I've gotten a number of grants since that orish- original uh, grant to go to Peru. I've got to spend time with one of the women in the book, Stephanie Grokey, who's a volcanologist who studies volcanoes and to use photography to document her science. So a lot of what I do these days is kind of collaborating with scientists to use photography and writing and Mm. other multimedia to help them tell their stories. 
I think it's really neat, you know, uh, for children, like, you know, as parents, sometimes I think we see these interests in our kids and they have these sort of innate interests and you don't ever really know where it's going to take them. And so what a neat thing to see that strand from your childhood. And I noticed that in the book too, a lot of these women talked about their childhoods and how, you know, this was kind of preparing them for their past. So that's really neat. And Claire, um, photojournalist, a conservation biologist, you've studied coral reefs, um, you you study underwater. Uh, that's fascinating. Your postdoctoral fellow at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. Um, you study marine ma uh, mammals and how they can be better protected in areas of conflict. Can you tell us just more about you and, and your life? Sure. Um, so I grew up um, in New Jersey and I, I grew up um, uh, mostly on the Jersey shore, which most people think of have like some image in their, in their mind related to MTV. Uh, but really Jersey shore is a really wild place. And so they've got, you know, fantastic marine mammals, seabirds, um, you know, fish, I was exposed to it all. And I also spent a lot of time as a, you know, I spent long summers just staring at the waves as an ocean lifeguard and, you know, having, you know, picking up little sea creatures and, kayaking with dolphins. And so I, I always knew I, I wanted to um, have a career that was related to ecology, environmental understanding, advocacy. I couldn't figure out what it was, but I just knew, I knew that I had an affinity for the environment and I wanted to uh, use my talents to help it. And so when I got uh, into college, um, I was good at, in at science, but I didn't have a role model for like what a career in science was. And I, I ended up getting this um, opportunity to work in a lab, a dolphin behavior lab at my university. And I spent a lot of time IDing like dolphin, um, uh, like, <laughs> like dorsal fins uh, for these, this pod in like Australia. And I really wanted to get to Australia. And the, the summer that I was eligible was like the one year they weren't going. And I was like, oh God, there it goes that. Um, and then after college, you know, I, I, I kind of was, wasn't, we didn't know what I wanted, to, which way I wanted to go, but I was really good at writing. And so I, you know, on a whim applied for a job at National Geographic, working hmm. for the magazine. And I thought, oh, maybe I could like be an environmental journalist. And I got an interview and I went in to the managing editor, Bob Poole at the time. And he said, well, you know, we already hired for this job. I was like, well, what am I doing here? You know? And they're like, well, there's television is hiring. And I was like, television? I don't know anything about television. Hmm. And I went down to, they walked me to the other building to meet this producer. He uh, producing like, you know, executive producer for wildlife television. And we just really hit it off. And it turns out that he had made a film about my advisor, the dolphin behavioral specialist at Dorstown. Oh, cool. And so she's like, oh, Janet Mann. And then Janet wrote me a recommendation and they hired me. And I didn't know what I was doing. And, you know, for a long time, I was, uh, anyways, it was a great, I learned so much about um, uh, media and storytelling in that job. But the, jo the thing that was most important for me is that I hadn't really spent a lot of time around scientists, but in that position, I, got to meet scientists all the time because I worked with them and this other producer and helping adapt like scientists work for like scripts for television and so I was meeting all of these scientists and I just got to know their work and them and they were interesting and outgoing and all these they kind of broke all these stereotypes of what I think the scientist was for me and I'll wrap this up really really quickly but I mentioned this because it was that opportunity of meeting scientists and diverse scientists that made me actually want to go back into science. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I had an opportunity to um, uh, create with, a, with a, another producer, uh, I had an opportunity to create like a six minute, like lifetime achievement reel for a scientist named Sylvia Earle. And she's probably the most well-known marine scientist in the world right now. And um, I got, I spent like, you know, weeks in the basement, like digging out old footage and I got to meet her and she was from New Jersey too. And she really inspired me to go back into science. And I went to my, my boss at the time. I was like, you know, I'm thinking about going back to, into science. And he said, you should. And so then I went back to Duke University and did brain lab for my master's. Um, but, you know, and then kind of from there, I continued to have this career that weaved between 
you know, my media training that I started getting at National Geographic and then kind of that went to journalism, but also my scientific career. But I mentioned that because it was really the opportunity of meeting scientists and like from all different walks of life and get into other personalities that kind of broke my own stereotypes of what a scientist is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really kind of what I hope this book does for kids too. Because yeah. I wish I had that experience right. well, you when hit I was on, 15 uh, as yeah. opposed to like 24. You know? Right. Well, you hit on two themes. One, one is the actual career. Like you said, I have these interests, but I don't really know what to do with it. Yeah. And so what's neat about this book is that you guys go through and with each, with each woman that you've highlighted, you know, it says what they are. So you have this idea of, oh, you know, I didn't really realize that that could be a job, you know, a mountaineer or, and then, and then additionally, like you said, you know, for, for young girls to be able to see themselves in these roles and to say, well, maybe I, you know, I could do that. I could be a paleontologist or, or these different things. So, okay. So let's talk about, let's talk about the book. Uh, you guys wrote a book together, which is really special. So, so where does you, where do your stories connect the two of you? Well, we met through the National Geographic Explorer community, and then we actually uh, decided at first that we wanted to do like a film series on women scientists because we saw kind of film uh, as a great opportunity to increase representation, to help like combat stereotypes about what scientists look like, who they are, what their stories are. And so we pitched this big film series and we got one film actually funded and we, we got to travel together to Zimbabwe to tell the story of um, or a small story of, of Dr. Marangels and Biza, who's one of the scientists featured in the book. She studies mm -hmm. lions yep. and is an amazing conservationist. And that story was really about um, the challenges that she'd face kind of balancing her academic career and, and motherhood and a family. And we thought it was a really important story for anybody to hear. Yeah. And then we got talking about, you know, well, this is great. We love doing these films. We'd love to do more of them. But if we really want to kind of, you know, help kids at this critical point, like Claire was talking about, like when they're 15, when they're 12, and they're thinking about what is my life going to look like? What can I do? How do I pursue my interests? Then like, maybe we need to be producing media and content for, you know, and a book for kids in that age range, like middle school, when you're really just starting to get curious and you want to know, what the possibilities are. And so we took Marangel's story. She was so kind to share it with us for the book as well. And then wanted to like complement it with all of these other stories that would both, you know, show and expose kids to different career pathways, but also kind of deal with some of these other themes that maybe kids might think about or have anxiety about or be curious about when they think about what it is to be a scientist. Mm. I love that. It's beautiful. You've done a, a superb job of doing that. How, how did you narrow down? How did you narrow down to the 25 women? Well, I think we, um, it was kind of an organic process, but, but uh, one, um, before the, before Gabby and I got together, I, I had written, I had done a very small like photo project on women in science in North Carolina. And I got um, nationally recognized for that project because um, it got picked up by National Geographic and Grist. And this is like 2015. And then I just got a slew of emails from that of other women of, you know, oh, so I, cool. people write me and say, hey, you should, you should uh, cover this woman and this one, this one. And so oh, some of it was recommendations. Some of it was um, women we already knew um, who are in the explore community. And some of it was kind of word of mouth, like Mirangels and Visa. I actually met her at a, at a conference um, and I was captivated when I, I heard her talk and I just went up to her and I just said, said, hey, I wanna know more about you. We stayed in touch and it was a really organic process, but I will say that we had way more women than these 25. Sure. And it was really yeah. hard to figure out who, I can imagine. who we should select. And we wanted, we, we, we had kind of two selection criteria. Well, one, like they need to be excited about the project, obviously, like they needed to want to be in the book. And, and so and not everyone wants to do that and that's fine. But the two main selection criteria is that was important to me uh, and Gabby was one that each of their stories kind of represented either uh, kind of like a unique path into science. Hmm. Um, like oh, I maybe love that. instead of being a traditional biologist, 
you're someone who loves biology and ecology, but you have, um, a, you're a great athlete and have like a lot of athletic talents, you know? So maybe you use those to, instead of being a scientist, be an expedition leader and lead scientists on these expeditions where you need to plan and organize and kind of use your athletic talents. And we have an expedition leader that we highlighted here in the book named Mallory Dimmitt, right? Because she's a, has a fantastic story. And then the other part was, um, that each of the women, we wanted a, you know, a diversity of, of scientific careers and their own backgrounds. Like, mm -hmm. so, you know, not just diversity of like racial diversity, which of course we wanted, but also cultural diversity, uh, you know, mm -hmm. where in the world they come from. Um, and so that kind of helped us narrow it down. You were, I mean, you really nailed it with the book. I mean, the 25 mm -hmm. women that you highlighted um, are just fascinating. And there is, uh, there's so much variety from story to story. So, so I'm sure that other people say this, but one of my favorite things is that each woman gives her advice. Um, and so that's part of, part of the book. So it's sort of formatted, like, you know, you highlight, so we could talk about the very first woman that you highlight in this book is Dominique Gonzalez. Um, and she's involved with saving elephants. Um, and so you have, and she's an ecologist and you have this information about her. Um, but then she gives her own advice. So she says, if you see an opportunity, take it, you know, but if there is no opportunity, make one, you know, and it goes on and on. So has this been, um, has, I, I really loved it. I mean, I think each woman's advice was different, but also there was these common themes of just, you know, um, of just dealing with rejection and, and dealing with hardship and, and keep going and be passionate. You know, have, have you gotten a lot of feedback that people really like this particular part of the book? Yeah, absolutely. And I think there are common themes, but like you said, we tried to also highlight these these very unique perspectives that each woman brought based on their experiences. And, you know, I think one of the themes that comes out a lot is like persistence and grit. Mm -hmm. And I think that that comes across and we wanted that to come across because yes. we didn't, you know, we didn't want to kind of sugarcoat this process of being a woman in science for kids, right? It, there yeah. are challenges. It is tough and it can be a very different experience also, depending on where you live in the world. And, yeah. you know, and so we wanted to have that kind of real talk in the book. And part of that was actually showing these instances where, you know, women came up against a barrier and how did yeah. they overcome it? You mm -hmm. know, whether it's somebody saying, uh, no, we don't have an opportunity for you. And then right. having to ask again and again and again, and not to just take no for an answer right away and to be persistent, or maybe it's, you know, not getting the permits to do a dig in Egypt at your kind of dream site when you think that there's that, you know, that perfect opportunity and how do you pivot and, and make your own other, you know, yeah. dream, you know, dream job or, or opportunity. And, and I think that there's a lot of stories like that of overcoming mm -hmm. failure. And we want, I think it's important today to have those stories because we do kind of live in this instant gratification society where, you know, we can just go online and order something and with a click of a button and have what we want next day. But with these kind of careers, you know, it does take persistence and, uh, and it's a long haul, but it's worth mm -hmm. it. And I think the women's stories also show that it's worth it. Yeah, yeah I think so too. I, a couple that come to mind in particular, um, it, Nora, Nora Shockey talks about, um, you know, she got these rejection letters. She's an archaeologist and she gets these three rejection letters from, um, you know, things she's trying to pursue. And then finally she gets accepted. And she says, all those rejection letters made this one acceptance so much sweeter, you know? So what a perspective. I mean, it, and I, you know, you do see that theme through that, you know, these women have pushed through. Um, and so, well, that encouraged me. I loved reading all the bits of advice and, and I'm sure then for a young girl, uh, it would do the exact same thing. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and I think for, uh, you know, there's a, you know, a lot of different cultures that these women are from, but I think especially, you know, I'm an American guy, American, uh, in American culture, there's such pressure for girls to kind of be like, I think perfect sometimes. And so hmm. if you get one rejection, it's like, okay, well, I'm not good at this. I'm going to pivot to something yeah. else. And to show that, like, you know, you might get three, four rejection letters before you get a yes and to keep yeah. on applying, you know what I mean? And I think that, um, that, you know, ability to like fail and get back up can often be seen as kind of like what boys do, you know, and not what girls do. 
And so I love Nora's, Nora's, um, yeah, she has her charge. I mean, she says, even if you get rejected, be persistent, become resilient, stay focused. Rejection will mold you and push you and make you grow. If people say you can't do something, be the first to do it. If you have something important to say, speak up and speak loudly. It's like one of those things that should be like on a poster, right? Like in your room or in your office, you know, it's so motivational. And all of these women, you know, is common, but also different. Like they have these just like, go get them mentality. And and so I found that their advice was um, just such a beautiful part of the book. Uh, another thing, then with each um, with each woman, you have a you know a slightly different is it informational page or ideas for families. So for example, with Dominique's, um, and she is. Uh, she's working with the elephants you have a, a section about creating a wildlife habitat in your own backyard so i like how you've taken something that you know not everyone can do right they cannot everyone can work with elephants um but everyone can maybe you know add a bird feeder or um so can you can you talk about how you you know uh how you came up with these these special sections at the end of each women's you know uh section like some are informational and some are activities I think we wanted, we really wanted kids, you know, these are just little introductions to these potential fields, right? You, you read it about this woman's story and you find out that, oh my goodness, I could be a, you know, photojournalist, or I could be a, you know, a paleontologist. And we wanted to then take that spark of curiosity and like give kids actionable steps they could take to then pursue that curiosity and take it a little further. And so each of those kind of little sections builds on themes in the woman's story and helps kids think about, you know, what is it like to be on a dig? I mean, M. Jackson's is about glaciers. She's a glaciologist. She studies glaciers. It tells you about glaciers. She also has a section on how to walk on a glacier that, you know, tells kids like, how do you actually go out and explore a glacier? And so I think we really wanted to instill that curiosity and and the opportunity for kids to get out even if it's in their backyards right and explore so it's and what i really liked is in even in those sections it's not all the same so you know in some of them it's informational and in other ones it's ideas for people to do so one that caught my attention that i think would catch the attention of of um young girls or boys was the one about the poop there's a whole page on poop in there <laughs> I so, have a three-year-old daughter, and that is what she turns to every single time. Sometimes she calls it, she, she sometimes she calls it Mama's book. Sometimes she calls it the poop book. Yeah. So <laughs> there you go. That's good marketing, right? Because yeah, buy because the, one, buy the poop of, book. Yeah, because Dr. Asha DeVos, DeVos, who is one of the scientists we featured in the book, um, she studies uh, she studies this rare popula population of blue whales, which are the largest. Uh, whales, they're the largest animals in the on planet Earth, the largest animals ever to exist on planet Earth, larger than any dinosaur. And she studies wow. them in Sri Lanka, and you can learn a lot about an animal that's hard to, you know, uh, observe in the wild by collecting their poop. You can tell if they're sick, what their diet is, sometimes if they're pregnant. And so it's the same with a lot of animals, elephant poop, badger poop. Mm. And so we have, you know, we tell, you know, kids like, Poop is something to be studied. It's not just icky. And I think I love that section of the book. I yeah, like you had a, it was interesting. An, Af, an adult African elephant can produce up to 300 pounds of poop a day. I mean, that's a lot. <laughs> yes. And that, an otter, an otter's poop is called sprint. And it can sometimes smell like violets. I mean, this is fascinating. So, so like I said, it's just very um, interesting how, you know, at the end of each section, it's just a little bit different, you know, whether it's in, and I like what you said, to pursue curiosity. So either it's hands on opportunities, or it's just interesting facts that sort of relate with, um, you know, the women's stories. Are you, um, are you still in contact with a lot of these women? Like, how do those relationships work? Do they, do they, you know, are they long term or kind of short term just because of the book? Well, a, lot, a number of them are, are close friends of ours that we've met through National Geographic over time. And I think it's, you know, it's been a wonderful opportunity to be able to kind of elevate their voices and their stories yeah. um, through this book. Um, and, you know, I, we're definitely in touch with all of them. And I think uh, all of them are really excited to share this. In fact, um, Wasfia Nazreen, who uh, is the woman who, who um, climbed the seven summits, 
yeah. uh, the highest mountains on each continent on our planet. She is extraordinary. She just flew some of the books out to Nepal and is taking them to libraries and, wow, right. um, you know, is, is sharing them uh, while she's on a journey out there, uh, also climbing some mountains. So, well, let's talk really about, fun. let's talk about Waspia. Um, as I'd written her down, it took her three times to do Denali. Um, and so I think we see this common theme that, you know, most people are not successful on their first go around, you know, and often have to try, try again. And that she had a uh, situation with frostbite. Um, uh, can you, can you tell us a little bit about uh, you know, sort of her obstacles and her story? Yeah, well, I think what was interesting about her story, um, one, she, you know, she set out to hike these seven summits, which is a feat for anyone. Very few people in the world have done this. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, she ended up coming, you know, getting to the top of Everest, getting to the top of these bigger mountains, because each, each of the continent has a different mountain and some are shorter and some are, you know, um, less onerous than others. And Denali was the one that really, um, it's not the tallest mountain, but it was the one that she had the most challenges with. And she had to raise money each time to go on these big expeditions. These aren't, you don't just show up in a car and, you know, get right. out and hike up. Like these are big, expensive expeditions where you have to have permits and you have to plan ahead of time. And so, you know, one time she gets frostbite and she talks about that in the book. Um, Another time she gets pretty ill, I believe. And, and, you know, she didn't give up, but she mm -hmm. talks about that, not as, you know, this kind of barrier, but she, what I love about it is she talks about what she learned from that experience. Yeah. She learned that it wasn't just about the ultimate goal. It was kind of about the journey and the process and that she needed to slow down and, and really appreciate kind of these incredible experiences she was having. And so I, I just, I love her story and how honest she is about that kind of introspective process that comes out of this very physical and difficult and challenging feat that she's undertaking. Yeah. And, and one addition, an additional thing about Wasti is that like, there was also a lot of pressure on her uh, because she was trying to be the very first person from Bangladesh. She's from, she's from Bangladesh, which is a small country, not so small, but ne right next to India. And she was trying to be the first person, not the first woman, but the first person from that country to wow. summit all the highest, the seven summits, the highest mountains of all, all the seven continents. And I think she faced a lot of pushback from people in her community, a lot of men who thought that maybe that was something a, a man should be doing, you know, like the first person yeah. should be a man and not sure. a woman. And she was a young woman. And yeah. she, so not only was she failing, but she was almost failing to, you know, kind of people's chagrin of like, of course she can't do it. You know what I mean? Wow, and she sure. talks a lot about um, how she's worked with girls in her, in her philanthropic work so that to kind of fight those stereotypes because there was just a lot of, you know, uh, mean things that were said to her online about her quest to do this as a woman and you know, people maybe relishing a little bit in her failures every time mm -hmm. failure happened. So it wasn't just the failure, it was people right who thought she couldn't do it, you know, kind of using that failure as a way to, you know. Like we told you so. Yeah, we told thing. you so. Yeah. yeah. And so that takes even more persistence. And mm -hmm. I don't really like using the term like grit because I feel like this is like a term that's been like overused with parents. But I really think it's the persistence of each of these women that has, mm -hmm. that is their, 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 you know, their, their secret sauce to their. Yeah. And they're resilient. Success. And I think, you know, that is actually a common theme to our podcast. I think it's come up in almost every episode as that, you know, in order to become a resilient person, you have to fail at things and, and you have to be able to get up and try again. And, you know, I think a lot of childhood experiences these days are very padded. Um, so kids are not necessarily maybe getting those opportunities. I mean, this last Fia, she had, um, she it says she took her glove off for just a split second and had frostbite and had to have six sur surgeries to save her finger. It was interesting with you you talking about her story. Her advice says the thing to realize is that no matter what we do, there will always be someone who has a problem with our decisions. It's important that we focus on our own path and know that anything is possible if we put our mind to it. So her advice goes right along with her story, mm -hmm. which, like you said, you know, people had a problem with what she was doing it, but mm -hmm. what she was doing, but she knew that that was her journey I, anyway. I think another thing that comes out and maybe like relates to resilience 
is the importance of like friendship and mentorship. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something we really wanted to get across to kids is that I think when you're younger, at least for me, like a stereotype I had about scientists is that they are like alone in a laboratory and they don't ever see people or maybe have friends. (laughs) And so (laughs) science didn't seem like something that I wanted to go into because I like people. And we really wanted to combat that kind of stereotype because science is this like highly, it can be this highly collaborative space where, you know, I work with people on, on my research from all over the world. And I'm constantly on meetings with other people who are interesting and have incredible ideas and who bring other things to a project and help me make it better. And so a lot of the women talk about in their advice, also the importance of having good mentors and like, um, you know, um, in Munaza Alam's uh, story, which she's an astronomer, her profile, we really wanted it to focus on like how female friendships and um, mentors, you know, would actually helped her in her research career. Yeah, yeah, that's really important. Um, And uh, I mean, even the fact that you guys did this together, I mean, that's very unique. Right. And you have a friendship that dates back a decade or more. So that's that's a really special thing. I mean, you're you're modeling it, you know, right <laughs> right on the cover, you know, that yeah. these relationships uh, are strong and they last and and they're mutually beneficial and they're powerful. Right. Like you're together. You have brought, you know, this beautiful book into the world and the stories yeah. of all these women. And I, I just so, want to say you know, real quick before we move on to that, is that like, I you know, this working with Gabby on this has been such a joy because we complement each other really well. And, you know, Gabby and I haven't seen each other. When was the last time I saw you physically? <laughs> two years ago? Two, two and a half years. Yeah, it's been we're, a while. But we're on the phone every single day. Yeah, every single day. <laughs> and um, I've called Gabby when I have really struggled with other things and she's called me and like, you know, we're constantly asking each other for their advice. And I think my friendship with Gabby is one of the most important you know, not to get too sentimental, but it's one of the most important relationships I have now. And it's really grown through this book and the trust you build through it. And there have been some hard times with this book for ourselves. I mean, we got an email at the beginning of the pandemic saying, um, you know, we're putting a pause on this book because National Geographic was struggling. And uh, just like all companies were, it was a lot of uncertainty. And, and we weren't sure. We weren't sure this book was going to see the light of day after so much work. And wow. here we are now. And um, I just gonna say, it's like, yes, this book is about women and uh, how to, you know, forge your own path. And I think our path has included each other. And it's been so important that we wrote this book together. I would never have uh, created this book alone and been on this journey alone. I mean, it just, you know, hmm. so find female friendships, I think, uh, are just so important in our field. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. That's yes. beautiful. What a st- how neat that your story reflects the other stories. I mean, these are universal experiences, right? You know, that we need relationships and um, and we need to just keep going when things are hard. I was really drawn to, so I like photography. I have a good camera. I'm so bad at it. <laughs> I cannot, I do not, I don't know. I mean, you've been winning, Gabby, you've been winning stuff since you're 15. I'm like, I'm working on it all the time and I'm just always like, oh, none of these look good. But um, so on a personal level, I was drawn to the stories of the photographers um, and it was really neat because, you know, the photographers gave specific advice. So um, Hannah Reyes Morales, you know, she talked about, I really love this. She had the beautiful photos in there. Don't wait to tell stories until you can travel to a far off place. Interesting things are happening to everyone everywhere and you can uncover them by asking and being curious. So, you know, on a personal level, I was really um, drawn to the photographers. Annie Griffith was, was another one. I um, mean, she actually talked about how being a woman opened doors for her, mm-hmm. you know, it allowed her to go to places that men couldn't maybe with mothers or to see these different um, uh, scenarios. And I thought that was really neat. So I liked it. She had tips in there for aspiring photographers. And I also was really drawn to the Florida Springs diver, Jenny Adler. And because we've actually been down to some of the Florida Springs, there's like a thousand of them there. They're so beautiful. But uh, that said, I mean, you guys just have such a list here. Marine biologist, planetary scientist, you know, a long distance hiker. You did such a phenomenal job of a volcanologist. Did I say that right? (laughs) 
a volcanologist. Yeah, exactly. Vol I did not say it right then. A volcanologist, a citizen scientist. I mean, you have just done such a great job. Are you finding that people are really just drawn to different ones? I think so. And I think, I think we should just also say, since Claire and I are both scientists, right? We also kind of like looked at the research on what, you know, what would it make this book effective in terms of our goals of encouraging kids, right? And one of the, one of the pieces of research that I think really stuck with me is that, you know, people have a pretty narrow definition and especially kids of what counts as science. And mm -hmm. so we wanted to like have, you know, Jenny Adler and um, Hannah and these photographers or Mallory Dimmitt, like Claire spoke about earlier, the expedition leader or Jennifer Farr Davis, a long distance hiker, so that we could kind of expand people's definition and thoughts about like what a scientific career might could look like or how you can contribute to the knowledge of our world and the study of our world, even if you don't go and get a formal degree in science. And we also have Jean Beasley, who is a sea turtle rehabilitator um, who oh, is a citizen yeah. scientist. She doesn't have it. She's a, she was a school teacher, right, Claire? Yeah. She, she started her, her career in wildlife rehabilitation in her retirement because she found a turtle that was in a bad way on, uh, on the beaches of North Carolina. And she brought it to, um, NC state up in Raleigh and, uh, you know, kind of stayed up there for the night. And then, uh, you know, was about to leave. And she's like, you know, I'd love to come back and visit this turtle. And the researchers at the university is like, what are you talking about? We can't keep this turtle here. You're taking this turtle back home with you. She's like, well, what do, what do I do with this? And she put it in like a baby pool, like, you know, those big, like round plastic baby pools in her garage. And she kind of just learned how to rehabilitate turtles by, you know, making phone calls. And she opened a sea turtle hospital. It was all in her retirement. And in that way, she was able to teach others how to rehabilitate turtles. And I think she's been on like six different scientific papers in her 70s and 80s. And she was just a retired school teacher. And she considers herself a citizen scientist because she doesn't have any formal scientific training. And she does rely on other scientists to kind of do more of the hardcore like research. But scientists are learning from her. They learn from her on protocols the best way to rehabilitate sea turtles long term and I just love that you know um mm -hmm. I, I just love that we have someone you know so e even for parents maybe you're looking at this book and you think oh god maybe I wish I had gone into science you know I can encourage my kid well it's not too late for you too parents yeah you know? <laughs> yeah you know what a good point that you hit the diversity even in age um and and I think it yeah it is never too late and we can always learn and grow and I liked I even had written down a little bit about the sea turtles that they can detect because you have this in the book that they can detect the invisible lines of the earth's magnetic field. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. So what a fascinating book, Claire and Gabby. I just, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, it's beautifully laid out. It's called No Boundaries, 25 Women Explorers and Scientists Share Adventures, Inspiration and Advice. Um, I just think you just did a bang up job with this. I just, the, the amount of variety and the amount of inspiration that's in there, the amount of things that we can learn and do and try on our own. If people are wanting to find out more about um, your book, about you two, um, about the women that you highlighted, what, what are what are some good things for where uh, places for them to go, or where can they find yeah, all this well, stuff? I'll just make a very quick plug. So you can the book is available anywhere books are sold. You can buy it at a local bookstore. You can buy it on Amazon. If you buy it on Amazon, please leave us a review. We'd love to know yeah. what you think about it. If you buy the book after, um, I think it's February fifteenth, you can buy it on shopdisney.com. And the advantage awesome. then is if you buy it on shopdisney.com after February 15th, it'll be part of this uh, buy a book, give a book program where your purchase of a book will then lead to the, the gifting of a book to um, a, you know, a school or a community in need. Um, and so we're really thrilled that that, uh, that program Disney is offering us is for our book goes through the end of uh, 2022. Um, wow, so do that. that's awesome. Yeah. Well, is it is it buy a book, give a book, and it's they'll get your book? Uh, so if you go to shopdisney.com, you just purchase the book as you would any other yeah. way. The book will come to your house. And then Disney, you can see there's information on their site about the, the buy a book, give a book program. They've partnered with a foundation so that they'll make sure that with your book purchase, they'll add, they'll gift a second book to a community so cool. and need somewhere in the United States. That's um, awesome. So, so whatever... But if you want to get it before then, you can buy it on Amazon too, or your local bookshop. 
And then to follow us, Gabby and I are both on social media. You'll find me on Instagram or Twitter. And just my name, Claire Fiesler, so C-L-A-R-E-F-I-E-S-E-L-E-R. You'll post it. I'll put links, yeah. <laughs> Gabby, and what do you want to say? How should people find you? Absolutely, same thing. I'm on I'm on all, all the platforms and at my website, which is just my name, GabbySalazar.com. All right. So we always end our um, podcast uh, and it's kind of neat because actually this theme was in your book as well. But we end a podcast with a favorite outdoor childhood memory oh. of yours. Mm-hmm. So Claire, are you up for going first? Yes, I will. Uh, okay. It's two memories in one. I'll make it very, very short. When I was growing up in the 1980s on the Jersey shore, we were having a big pub. Uh, I remember walking along the beaches and like picking up medical trash, syringes and other things because we were having a big ocean dumping uh, problem. And for a couple of years, actually, we couldn't even swim at the beach. Uh, Fast forward to, you know, I'm a beach lifeguard. Uh, 15 years later and every morning I'm kayaking on, you know, along the beaches of New Jersey with dolphins, you know, at 7 a.m. And, you know, the the waters of the Jersey Shore had been cleaned up within you know, my just short childhood. And I think I always have that memory of just, you know, change in action can make a difference. We can go from really, really bad to a, a restored ecosystem with action. And I, I just, that is my strongest memory growing up uh, on the Jersey Shore of kind of being in the environment and just the dichotomy of that. And that stays with me and that gives me hope. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Gabby, you have one? Yeah. The first thing that came to mind was, I think, one of the first experiences I had in nature where I realized there was this whole kind of world, you know, in my backyard that I, you know, I I just hadn't been paying attention to. I was actually at my grandmother's house uh, in North Carolina and was hiking down a a blackberry trail, picking blackberries. And um, I heard something and I hid behind a tree and an entire herd of maybe 30, 20, 30 deer, it must have been, or it felt like it at the time, ran by on the trail by me. And I must have been six or seven years old. And I just remember being filled with wonder and knowing that I wanted to just keep having that same experience of being filled with wonder. And I think that that is what has kept me uh, out in nature. That's so beautiful. And like I said, a lot of the women in your book talk about their different childhood experiences in nature as well. Well, thank you. Thank you, Gabby. Thank Thank you, Claire. The book is No Boundaries. Really highly recommend it. Um, And I really appreciate you guys being on. It was a party. Thank you. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it too.